One, two, three. Today we're starting our new unit, Unit 8. It's on the coast, beaches and shorelines. So some general features of beaches. The shore is the zone that lies between the low tide and the highest area on land affected by storm waves. The coast extends inland as far as ocean-related features are found. The coastline is the boundary between the shore and the coast. The back shore is the part of the shore above the high tide shoreline. The foreshore is part of the shore exposed at low tide and submerged at high tide. And the shoreline is the water's edge that migrates with the tide. Then we have near shore, which extends seaward from low, towards low tide shoreline to low tide breaker line. Offshore is the zone below low tide breakers. Beach is the wave work sediment deposit, deposit of the shore area. It's the area of the beach above the shoreline, often called the recreational beach. Wave cut beach is flat wave eroded surface. The berm is dry, generally sloping elevated beach margin at the foot of the coastal cliffs or sand dunes. Beach face is wet sloping surface extending from the berm to the shoreline. It's also called the low tide surface. It's low tide terrace. And a dune is a mound of sand formed by the wind. It's usually along the beach. Dunes form when wind blows sand into a sheltered area behind an obstacle. They grow as the grains of sand accumulate. Every dune has a windward side and a slip face. And then we have longshore bars, which are sandbars parallel to the coast. They may not always be present. They can cause approaching waves to break. And then we have the longshore trowel, uh, separates the longshore bar from the beach face. So shoreline zones can be viewed by looking at the beach profile, which is divided into four primary zones, offshore, near shore, foreshore, and backshore. The offshore is below any shoreline derived process, but is still geologically active due to the cascading sands. The near shore is affected by the waves. That's the part of the shore where the water is at half wavelength or less. The width of this zone depends on the maximum wavelength of the approaching wave train. The near shore area when looking at rocks deposited in this zone is typically called the shore face, and it is broken into two segments, upper shore face, which is affected by everyday wave action, typically fine laminated sand, and lower shore face, the area only moved by storm waves, which has a rocky stratified sand. The surf zone is where the waves break. This area is periodically wet and dry because the wave action and tides. And then the foreshore, which is made of the planar laminated and it's well sorted sand. The beach face is where the swash of the breaking wave runs up and the back swash flows back in. Above the beach face are low ridges called berms. During the summer in North America, when most people visit the beach, the zone of footprints and beach umbrellas is the summer berm. Wave energy is typically lower in the summer, which allows sand to be piled onto the beach. Behind the summer burn is typically a low ridge of sand representing the winter berm. Beach goers walk across the winter berm from the parking lot to the summer berm where they park their items. Higher winter storm energy moves the summer berm sand off the beach and piles it. There may be a zone of dunes behind the berms representing the sand blown in behind the beach by onshore winds. This area behind the berms is always above the ocean in normal conditions, is known as the back shore. Longshore bar and troughs beaches consist of a shore parallel bar separated from the beach by a deep trough. Breakers are typically 1.5 to 2 meters high and rip currents are moderate. The beach is generally straight and composed of medium sand with moderate to steep beach face. Cusps are also, also often present in the upper beach. At Longshore Bar and Trough Beach, 
The deep trough and the distance outer bar generally restricts most, most bays or paws. One, two, three. Longshore bar and trough beaches generally consist of a shore parallel bar separated from the beach by a deep trough. Breakers are typically 1.5 to 2 meters high and rip currents are moderate. The beach is usually straight. It's composed of medium sand. Cusp are also often present on the beach. At longshore bar and trough beaches, the deep trough and the distance to the outer bar generally restricts most bathers to the swash and inner trough. Composition of beaches. Several different compositions. Um, it's formed by what's locally available. It can be coarse or fine grained. Um, can be Pause. One, two, three. Composition of beaches. Always formed by available material. It can be coarse or it could be fine grained. There can be biological material on some of them. And material is always in transit along the shoreline. So the first kind of beach we'll look at is a sandy beach, most common of beach in the world. They're found virtually everywhere. Uh, typically occurs on coasts where, where, pause, one, two, three. So the composition of beaches, it's always formed by locally available material. It can be coarse or grind. Gr oh my God. Pause, one, two, three. Composition of beaches. It's always formed by locally available material. It can be coarse or fine grained sediments. Um, there can be biological material on some tropical beaches and material is always in transit along the shoreline, which means it's always moving. So sandy beaches are the most common of all beach types in the world. They're found on virtually every continent. This type of beach occurs on coasts that have low energy waves, which deposit the sand onto the beach after being transported by ocean currents. Sandy beaches are most susceptible to backwash erosion. Pebbles are found on virtually every beach on earth. However, there are a few beaches in the world that are entirely composed of pebbles, which are known as pebble beaches. The pebbles that cover the beaches vary in size, ranging from 0.1 and 7.9 7 inches in diameter. The larger pebbles are often found nearer to the shore. Pebble beaches are formed after pebbles carried by ocean currents are deposited on the shore by high energy waves. And then we have boulder beaches. They're so named because hmm, there's boulders that cover their shoreline. The size of boulders found on the boulder beach range from tiny pebbles to house-sized boulders. And we have shell beaches. It's almost entirely made of shells. They're usually sharp. The shells that cover these beaches are mainly from dead mollusks and deposited on the shore by waves. In some beaches, the shell layer can be dozens of feet in depth. Examples of this type of beach are quite few and only two exist that are true shell beaches. They're in Australia Shell Beach and Sanibel Shell Beach in the United States. Sea glass is another substance that covers some of the earth's beaches. Sea glass forms after broken glass is deposited in the sea and it's acted upon by erosion action, which over and over sharpens the sharp, smoothens, smooths the sharp edges and results in a piece of glass that's smoothed all around. Um, erosion of volcanic rock as water goes down the side of a volcano. Rivers and streams can cut through volcanic rock as they flow and cause erosion. The eroded fragments of rock usually continue to break down as they travel towards the ocean, and then small sediments are released into the ocean. Another uncommon way that black sand and black sand beaches are formed is when hot lava hits the cold ocean water and cools very quickly, causing it to shatter and break into pieces of basalt fragments of all sizes, including grains of black sand. During a volcanic eruption, enough lava can interact this way with the ocean that a new black sand beach can literally form overnight. Pause. 
pause. One, two, three. Composition of beaches. They're formed from locally available materials. They can be coarse or fine grained. They can have significant biological materials on them. And the material is always moving along the shoreline. The first one we're gonna look at is sandy beaches. They're the most common beach of all the types in the world. The type of beach typically occurs on coasts that have low energy waves. Uh, they can be susceptible to backwash erosion and powerful storms. Pebble beaches are found on virtually every beach on Earth too. However, there are a few beaches in the world that are entirely composed of pebbles and they're known as pebble beaches. The pebbles that cover these beaches vary in size, ranging from 0.1 to 7.9 inches in diameter. The larger pebbles are generally found nearer to the shore. Pebble beaches are formed after pebbles are carried by ocean currents and deposited on the shore by high energy waves. Boulder beaches are so named because of the boulders that cover their shorelines. The size of the boulders found on boulder beaches range from tiny pebbles to huge house-sized boulders. Shell beaches are almost entirely made of shells. The shells that cover these beaches are mainly from dead mollusks and are deposited on the shore by waves. In some beaches, the shell layer can be dozens of feet high in depth. Examples of this type of beach are quite few, and only two exist that are true shell beaches, and they are Australia Shell Beach and Sanibel Shell Beach in the United States. Sea glass is another substance that covers some of the Earth's beaches. Sea glass forms after broken glass is disposed of in the sea, and it's acted upon by erosion, which over time smooths its sharpened edges to result in a piece of glass with smooth and softened rounded surfaces. Black beaches and volcanic rocks occur from erosion of volcanic rock as water flows down the side of a volcano. Rivers and streams can cut through the black volcanic rock as they flow and cause erosion. The eroded fragments of rock usually continue to break down as they travel towards the ocean, and then small sediments are released into the ocean. Another common way that black sand and black sand beaches are formed is when hot lava hits the cold water and cools very quickly, causing it to shatter and break into pieces of basalt fragments of all sizes, including grains of black sand. During a volcanic eruption, enough lava can interact this way with the ocean that a new black sand beach can form literally overnight. So the sand movement along the beach, it's always perpendicular to the shoreline toward and away. The swash water rushes up on the beach, the backwash water drains back to the ocean, bringing sand with it. Parallel to the shoreline up the coast or down the coast is the longshore current. It transports sand along the beach of millions and tons of so Pause. One, two, three. So sand movement along the beach. If it's perpendicular to the shoreline toward and away, swash the water rushes up to the beach and backwash the water drains back to the ocean, both carrying sand with it. If it's parallel to the shoreline, up coast or down coast, the longshore current transports sand along the beach. Millions of tons of sediment move yearly. The direction of transport changes due to the wave approach and net sediment movement is southward along the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of the United States. And this is showing how the longshore moves it up and down the beach and how the near shore, the swash and backwash, bring it up and back in a parallel motion. So light versus um, pause.
All right, so this is a table. Pause. One, two, three. All right, this table shows a little bit about light wave activity and heavy wave activity. So the berm and the long shore bar and light wave activity, the berm is going to grow and the long shore shrinks. In heavy wave activity, the long shore grows and the berm shrinks. It's exactly opposite. The wave energy is low in light wave and high in heavy wave. And the characteristics of these are a summertime beach and light wave activity. Sandy with the wide berm, steep beach face, kind of like ours. And then heavy wave activity is a wintertime beach. It's rocky. There's a thin burn, um, flattened beach face. You'll see this in Maine, in Washington, and in Oregon. So a summertime beach has light wave activity. Pause. One, two, three. Summertime beach has light wave activity. There's wide sandy berms. They have a steep beach face, the swash dominance. The long shore bars are not present. It's generally milder. And if you notice, it's kind of like ours when you look at it. And the wintertime beach has heavy wave activity. Backwash dominates. Sediment is moved away from the shore, has a narrower, narrower beach, flattened beach face. And longshore bars are present, and this is generally along stormy weather. One, two, three. There are two major types of shores. The first one is an erosional shore. Erosional shores have well-developed cliffs. They exist where plate tectonics uplift the coast, and the U.S. Pacific coast is one example. You see these very sharp, steep cliff cliffs off of California, Oregon, um, some places in Washington. And then we have the depositional shores. Depositional shores are gradually, gradually subsiding shores. There's barrier islands and sand deposits that are common. This is our side of the um, United States, all the way up to about New York. And then we start seeing some more cliff face. So erosional beaches. Um, headbands are protruding bits of land and they absorb much of the wave energy. Wave cut cliffs and sea caves are also, also pause, one, two, three. Erosional beach forms. So a headband um, is a protruding, protruding bit of land and it's a sort. God dang it. Pause. One, two, three. A headland is a protruding bit of land and it absorbs much of the wave's energy. There are wave cut cliffs and sea caves that are carved out by wave activity. Sea arches form where sea caves in the headlands erode all the way through. Sea stacks form when the tops of sea arches erode away completely. The uplift of the wave cut bench generates a marine terrace. Wave erosion increases with more shore exposed to the open ocean, smaller tidal range, and weaker bed bedrock. Dep depositional beaches have a bay barrier or a bay mouth bar, which seals off of a lagoon from the ocean. A tide island refers to an island which is connected to the mainland by a narrow piece of land called a tambalo. Refraction and diffraction of waves are responsible for the formation of a tide island. Waves slow down as they approach an island, and the shallow water around the island causes waves to bend to the opposite side. The movement pushes settlement on the lee side of the islands, causing accumulation over time. 
and eventually a strip of land emerges connecting the island to the mainland and thus forming the Tide Island. Some of the major Tide Islands around the world. Pause. One, two, three. Depositional beaches. A bay barrier or bay mouth bar seals off a lagoon from the ocean. A tide island refers to an island which is connected to the mainland by a narrow piece of land called a tombalo. A tombalo was formed when a spit connects the mainland coast to an island. A spit is a feature that is formed through deposition of material at coastlines. The process of longshore drift occurs and this moves material along the coastline. Barrier islands, longshore and offshore sand deposits that are parallel to the coast. A spit is a deposition, a settlement that forms a spit, but its shape changes as a result of wave refraction. Spits are eroded by the sea and wind, but a constant supply of sediment from longshore drift ensures that they continue existence. Events such as storms change the shape of a spit drastically over short periods of time. Cuspit forelands, also known as cuspate barriers or nesses in Britain, are geological features found along coastlines and lakeshores that are created primarily from longshore drift. They extend outward from the shoreline in a triangular shape. There are three coasts on the continental United States, the Atlantic Coast, Pacific Coast, and Gulf Coast. Each has its own unique characteristics. The Atlantic coast, where we live, um, is most open to shore wave attack. Barrier islands common to Massachusetts and south. Bedrock, the Florida bedrock, is resistant limestone. Northward through New Jersey, it's composed easily um, erodible recent deposits. New York through Maine has glacier-affected rocks. Strong storms called nor'easters can damage the coasts north of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Nor'easters can generate storm waves up to six meters. An average erosion is 0.8 meters or 2.6 feet per year. The sea is migrating landward. Delaware, New York, and Georgia have the most serious erosion problem. Northern Maine is st still rebounding from the last ice age and the sea level is dropping. The Pacific coast is tectonically rising. It experiences less erosion than the Atlantic or the Gulf Coast. Open exposure to high energy waves, the average rate of, of erosion is about 0 0.005 meters or 0 0.016 feet per year. And lastly, we have the Gulf Coast, which has a low tidal range, generally low wave activity. It's tectonically subsiding. Mississippi Delta dominates. The local sea level rises due to compaction of the delta se sediments. The average rate of erosion is 1.8 meters or 6 feet per year.